Hi. Hello again. We're on page 105 of the Proclaimers book. Uh, the subhead now is, it has to work. It is from Jehovah. Circularity of reasoning here. Mm -hmm. And they've just dealt with the 60s and early 70s and their Life Everlasting book, minus the scandal, and the Truth book, minus the scandal. And this reasoning always reminds me when I hear something like this of my country right or wrong, i.e. it has to be God's plan and has to be God doing because it's God's organization. And we're, we all know he has an organization in the last mm -hmm. days and so on and so on. Yeah. And they dive right into the changes that happened now in the, in the 1970s and 80s. So they tend to call the changes, of course, adjustments. Adjustments. We remember that word being introduced frequently in, in our in a time in, inside. And here's how they deal with it. For many years, the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses were organized so that one spiritually qualified man was appointed by the society to be congregation servant or overseer, quotation marks around overseer, and was assisted by other appointed servants, quotation marks around the word servants. These men were to serve the flock, not to rule over it. But could the congregations more closely conform to the structure of the first century Christian congregations. In 1971, at a series of conventions held throughout the earth, the talk theocratic organization amidst democracies and communism was presented. On July 2nd, F.W. Franz delivered the talk at Yankee Stadium in New York City. In it, he pointed out that where enough qualified men were available, first century congregations had more than one overseer. The congregational group of overseers, he stated, would compose a body of older men. The members of such a body or assembly of older men were all equal, having the same official status and none of them was the most important, most prominent, most powerful member in the congregation. That talk really stirred the entire convention. What impact would this information have on the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses around the world? The answer came two days later in the concluding talk given by N.H. Knorr. Beginning October 1, 1972, adjustments in the oversight of the congregations worldwide would become effective. No longer would there be just one congregation servant or overseer. But during the months leading up to October 1, 1972, responsible mature men in each congregation would, be rec would recommend to the society for appointment the names of those who would serve as a body of elders and the names of those who would serve as ministerial servants. One elder would be designated chairman, but all the elders would have equal authority and share the responsibility for making decisions. These organization adjustments, explained Brother Knorr, will help to bring the operation of the congregations into closer conformity with God's word, and surely that will result in greater blessings from Jehovah. And they have a footnote, and I, I wondered a few minutes ago why they put it in a footnote, and mm -hmm. then the light went on. Here's the footnote. The speaker also explained that, that beginning October 1, 1972, let me see if I can read this, there would be a yearly rotating of chairmanship within each congregation's body of elders. This arrangement was adjusted in 1983 when, such, when each body of elders was asked to recommend a presiding overseer who, after appointment by the society, would serve for an indefinite period of time as the chairman of the body of elders. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk more about that later, no doubt. Okay. How was this information about organization adjustments received by the assembled delegates? One traveling overseer was moved to say, It has to work. It is from Jehovah. Another witness of long experience added, it will be an encouragement to all mature men to take hold of responsibility. Indeed, as many men are qualified, could now reach out and be appointed to the office of overseer. 
A greater number of brothers could thus gain valuable experience in shouldering congregation responsibility. Though they did not realize this at first, all of these would be needed to shepherd the great influx of new ones in the years to come. The material presented at the convention also led to some clarifications and adjustments that involved the governing body. On September 6, 1971, it was re resolved that the chairmanship of the governing body should rotate among its members, doing so alphabetically. Several weeks later, on October 1, 1971, F. W. Franz became the chairman of the governing body for one year. The following year, in September 1972, the first shifting of responsibilities in the congregations began, and by October 1, the rotation in most congregations was completed. During the next three years, Jehovah's Witnesses experienced impressive growth, over three quarters of a million persons getting baptized. But now they were facing the autumn of 1975, if all the expectations concerning 1975 were not realized, how would this affect their zeal for the global preaching activity as well as their worldwide unity? Also, for decades, Nathan H. Knorr, a man with a dynamic personality and outstanding ability as an organizer, had played a key role in advancing education within the organization, getting the Bible into the hands of the people and helping them to understand it. How would the change to closer supervision by the governing body affect these objectives. Well, that's mm -hmm. the end of chapter 8. And then mm -hmm. chapter 9 begins, Jehovah's Word keeps movi moving speedily. But I thought to show you this picture, mm -hmm. an impressive array of very colorful books on page 107. All the publications, all the books anyway, that came out between the end of Rutherford's life and the beginning of Noor's presidency, 1942, and 1975, all these mm -hmm. publications came out. And sure, it it looked impressive to me at the time. Mm -hmm. and then I realized, well, I look at it now, and I realized not one of these books is still in print. Now, that's mm -hmm. ominous when you think about that from the standpoint of religion, because yeah. I don't know even another cult that doesn't publish the books of its founder and its most important uh, leaders of the past. It has to rewrite everything. So, yeah, this is Nathan Knorr's presidency. All these publications, as it says here, is the, the, his leadership in education. But are these men qualified at all to write books, let alone yeah. publish, pu books, publish books them by the tens of millions? go out of print, but, I mean, they're, they're also a publishing interest. Empire, yeah. So if, if you're a publishing interest, you want to keep new books coming out <laughs> for people to keep having to buy them, and you've already built in an audience immediately you get all your members buying at least one copy. Yeah, usually more. several, giving them to their family members, etc., yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That Everybody was used to doing that. Yeah. But let's you face it, we're, we're, it. We're, we're, we're far more cynical about that now than we yeah. were then. That's true. And, and the, mm -hmm. Then you would go back to what, what we just said in that footnote. One, one of the changes is this adjustment that took place in 72 and then another one in 83. So they go back, they go mm -hmm. from... They go from, there's, there's going to be a rotation of elders, and even, even the presiding overseer is going to be rotated. Now they want to have one permanently in place. Yeah. So all that really has been added, all that really has been added, really, is you think, at least I thought at the time, that this change was a beneficial one. I yeah. think it was. But, but the point is they've left out an inconvenient fact here. Yeah, so they, they start this whole thing by saying, for many years the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses were organized so that one spiritually qualified man was appointed by the society to be congregation overseer. But that's that doesn't go back far enough because that wasn't always the case. In so, Russell's day, the local congregation chose their own elders. Elected elders, which yeah. is the Presbyterian way among other Protestant mm -hmm. congregations, right? elected yeah. elders. Rutherford got rid of that in the pretense of making the organization theocratic. Now yeah. you've gone back to elders. Yeah, so, you know, you're saying that you're doing these things because you want to be more biblical. Well, then you don't, why are you going back and forth? 
But the, for me, the most disturbing fact in that first sentence is the wording. It's so carefully worded that you might miss the fact that they don't say what would be the obvious way to say it, that previously Probably, we, yeah. we had only one man in charge. Now they say, for many years, the congregation. So you avoid the embarrassment of admitting that you're actually going back. Yeah, that you've changed your mind about things. <clears throat> but you can see the reasoning behind it is getting more control. Yeah. It's it's to have a centralized control so that the elders in a local congregation don't have so much power. That's right. Back when I joined in 1971, I was baptized. My very first experience in field service was with the congregation overseer. Mm-hmm. Well, I wasn't actually with him door to door, but I was with him at the coffee break. He was with mm-hmm. the the other who wasn't an elder at the time, but was would be later, my uh, study conductor, Bob. And and it was a kind of a prestige thing that we were going out with the presiding overseer of the congregation that morning, mm. that cold morning in probably uh, February or March of 1971. Mm. And yeah, I can understand now, looking back over 50 years to why they would make such a, a change that these men in the local congregation, after being there for a while, would have a, quite a bit of influence. Yeah, and it would be power. easier to control a body of elders that was rotating it as to its leadership. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I, they, they said something here that I don't, you know, they say um, that there was uh, an adjustment with the governing body, but they talk about them uh, having... Um, a chairman in the governing body, and I don't ever remember no. that. It was no. always a president, a vice president, yeah. treasurer, and secretary. Treasurer, mm-hmm. yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that was a corporate structure, and we were used to that yeah. at the time at which I joined. Wasn't that was later. the way it was structured. The, the, yeah. we, we referred to the a larger body of people with those three men as the totems, as it were, yeah. We referred to the larger body as the board of directors. We didn't think of them as elders or a governing body. It wasn't until I'd left that I started thinking about the terms. They're, they're not biblical terms. President and vice president, you're not going to find that anywhere in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. It's not a Jewish model based on the Old Testament, so there's no Old Testament president. <laughs> It's more like corporation. It, 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 Business. It, 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 the theocratic arrangement of the Old Testament and the New Testament doesn't have such a governing body or a board of directors. Mm-hmm. Now, that wouldn't have occurred to me at the time. No, no. So when we talk about getting back, as they, as they do here, when they talk about more closely conformed to the structure of the first century Christian congregations, well, there is no governing body. Yeah, it's still not closely, not even resembling it. And by the way, there was no governing body in the Old Testament either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you, you're, you're not continuous with what God has done before. The only governing body in the New Testament was the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish human construction yeah. without yeah. precedent even in the Old Testament itself. So, And I, I think it's interesting that it says in the second last paragraph, if all the expectations concerning 1975 were not realized... There's always this kind of mist, it seems to me. <laughs> Did we expect something or didn't we? You know, they try and kind of have it both ways. And why well, did you I have this? the people this... did and, and the organization didn't. But they sure did write as if they did. So what do we, to what do we credit the growth of three quarters of a million persons baptized in those few years? Well, at the time we were all excited thinking it was a sure sign. Of the end, yeah. but of course, looking back now and realizing there's a dimin- there's a diminishing of numbers for two years afterwards. It's because you realize it was pushing. the excitement about seventy five. Yeah. That's right. So, so the, to me, the, this is this is uh, the Watchtower Fudge Factory in, in, in operation. In operation, yeah. Right so here. So in the decade between nineteen sixty six, the Life Everlasting book, and nineteen seventy five, mm-hmm. you doubled in size. Yeah. And well, that happens every time. It. Every time there's an excitement about a date. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What's our link? Mm-hmm. Fred France explodes the governing body. Mm-hmm. Before an audience of J.W. missionaries, and that was uh, a discussion from Francis' book, uh, Ray Francis. Ray Francis' book. Yeah. Yeah. 
and the playlist of Governing Body and Jehovah's Witnesses we'll, put, we'll add. See you next time. Mm -hmm.